Hello again and welcome to this next video. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of presentations on systems engineering measurement. It's probably be the last one in that series. This was a 2015 paper presented at the INCOSI International Symposium on differentiating system architectures, applying architecture measures, and the architecture measures were reported in a 2013 paper, uh, which I of which I haven't made a video, um, but some of the key results will be presented here as well. That was a joint paper with Paul Cole of Lockheed Martin at the behest of the uh, NDIA National Defense Industrial Association Architecture Committee. So we worked together on that coming up with architecture measures and I thought, well, let's see if we can apply them to what people seem to indicate the reason why they wanted to measure an architecture was so that they could decide whether they had a good one or a not so good one. So that's really what this paper is about. So we're going to talk about what is an architecture using the definitions that were available at the time and why we need to differentiate architectures. In other words, how can we use the measures to make decisions? How do we measure an architecture? And that'll be a review of the key results from the 2013 paper, which is available in the Wiley and Cosi library. And how do we determine goodness? And then ultimately, when is one architecture better than another, which was something our sponsors were very interested in at the time. So what is an architecture? And this uh, definition comes from the 2011 version of the ISO standard that's been updated. And uh, I, unfortunately, I think it's been uh, reduced in effectiveness, this definition, but an architecture is the fundamental concepts or properties of a system and its environment embodied in its elements, relationships, and principles of its design and evolution. And unfortunately, the word elements has gotten removed in this latest definition from the current standard. But I think I take that to mean anything that relates to the content of the architecture. So it's not just the physical or logical elements, but the requirements themselves, the data associated with all of this and the related procedures. The relationships are extremely important, how these elements relate to each other, especially the interfaces and the principles get into architectural rules and patterns and overarching guidance. And there's much work been done on patterns and so forth. Uh, collectively, this approach to architecture is what we were working on at the time I retired from Boeing in 2015, an enterprise model-based systems engineering project called Integrated Product Architecture. So why do we need to differentiate architectures? Why is that important? And clearly people have the idea that some architectures might be better than others. We understand that they're different, but why would we need to, how do we figure out which ones are quote, better than others? And it turns out there's some things we do um, that affect system performance. So system performance may actually depend on the architecture we select. Things like range and speed that are related to weight, how we wire up, a platform, for example, and I'll show you some example later, discrete wiring versus data buses. There's a reason we've gone to data buses um, for the latest generations of platforms in aerospace or integrated versus distributed line replaceable units or highly integrated or more federated element architecture and network performance is going to depend on how we allocate functionality and service oriented architectures relate to this as well. Fault tolerance and reliability uh, is related to architecture. We add redundancy for critical systems and that clearly is an impact on architecture and differentiates one from another if no such redundancy is available. And these are in, in some cases dependent on reliability and criticality, but it also affects main, maintainability and our ability to isolate failures when we're all done, 
or when we're dealing with failure, how can we quickly find the thing that's broken? So highly integrated architectures may be less amenable to effective fault isolation or how functionality is implemented where we have a more classical architecture of a function assigned to an element versus it taking more than 20 elements to effect a particular function that can make functional failure difficult to isolate among the possible 20 elements. So system performance in a number of areas, um, including maintainability, it can be affected by the architecture we're dealing with. A second aspect of this is that there also needs to be consistency of the program in terms of budget and activities and the architecture that's selected. Um, we found that if we have more highly integrated architectures, that it can be more difficult to perform integration at different levels. And some things have to wait for final assembly before we can actually fully evaluate, integrate, and verify certain capabilities. So if these are not properly uh, planned for and budgeted and scheduled, <clears throat> then we may run into problems along the way in terms of program impact. So different architectural patterns have different assumptions and consequences, and we have to make sure that the program is consistent with the implications of those different architectural patterns. And we'll talk about some of these along the way. Ultimately, if we have the wrong architecture or it's inconsistent with the program, then we may doom our project, either for technical reasons, because the architecture doesn't work technically, or programmatically, because we have such a mismatch between the demands of the architecture on the program, the planned program, that we can't realize a project project success given the constraints that have been established like budget and schedule. So how do we measure an architecture? And this was first discussed in the paper I did with Paul Cole, first presented at the NDIA conference in 2012, I believe, and then presented at the INCOSI Symposium in 2013. We had several categories. But we need to be able to measure if we want to be able to differentiate among different architectures or determine, if you will, better than or good bad. So we had several technical measures that were proposed related to size and complexity and completeness and quality, both quality of the representation and quality of the solution. And notice the functionality has a dependency on time because stability ends up being a very important factor with respect to some of these measures once a baseline is achieved. In other words, the absolute value doesn't matter so much, but whether that value is stable over time can uh, affect what's going on in the project. So cost and effort are measured by other processes like earned value management. They have been well established. So we're going to concentrate on some of these other categories, the technical measures in the following slides. There are a series of tables that are in this presentation. The first two columns, the proposed measures and the definition description were pre presented in the 2013 paper. We've added this third column as to whether this particular proposed measure would be an architecture discriminator. So I'm going to highlight the ones that I think are important that have a yes and are in the bright green here. Um, number of elements, perhaps that's an architecture discriminator, but generally it's not as significant as the relationships and everything else. And stability may be very important in this regard, but the absolute number of elements, not so much. Number of external interfaces, yes, uh, we think that is an architecture discriminator. External interfaces are typically controlled by the context and the concept of operations. 
independently of the internal architecture, although the internal architecture has to be able to map to the external interfaces as well. And an example of a complication is that hybrid vehicles, uh, road vehicles, land vehicles, require two energy power interfaces compared with a simple gas powered or purely electric vehicle. So that's a complication. Um, whether that's detrimental or not, that still is something that can be measured as a potential discriminator in terms of complexity. The number of requirements um, can be, a, we view that that can be a discriminator because the requirements at each level are going to depend on the architectural choices. So if we have a steep architecture, we're gonna have more levels and probably more total requirements. Similarly, the number of internal interfaces can be a discriminator, um, and that depends on how we are coupling elements together. Uh, more interfaces require more interface management to address information exchanges and distributed functions. Number of interactions, like the transaction types and messages and the frequency of distribution and interaction. Yes, that can be discriminator. We can overload our networks, for example. So more interaction or data sharing across substance, subsystems requires more analysis and test and evaluation to make sure we understand the behavior and the failure effects and whether the networks can actually handle that degree of interaction. So these things highlighted in green um, were felt are felt to be discriminators. The other ones may be, but probably not the primary one, primarily primary primary differentiators with respect to size and complexity and stability. <clears throat> so an example, if we look at counts of requirements at each architecture level, and this is going to affect programmatically requirements management and technical processes like requirements development and system analysis and verification and integration. If we have a more steep architecture where we limit the fan out so we don't have more than a few uh, subordinate elements at the next lower level of the architecture, but we say every specification is going to have roughly 500 requirements, and we can easily see by including an intermediate layer, we end up with a, an additional level of requirements, these three in the middle. So we get a total in this case of 6,500 requirements, whereas if we have a flatter system architecture, where we go directly from a system level to nine elements at the next lower level, then our count of requirements is reduced substantially. This is where programmatic impacts can be uh, realized because we have to plan for managing and verifying these additional 1500 requirements. That has to happen somewhere. The, co the trade off complication is that the requirements analysis to go from system to subsystem to configuration item be, may be more straightforward compared with going directly from a system level to nine elements at the next lower level. So, this is the one to nine fan out is more complex. So, there's more demand, it's a more demanding analysis task, perhaps, even though it's a there are fewer requirements to manage. So like just about everything in systems engineering, there's a trade-off, but we need to make sure that the program is planned accordingly so that we have the appropriate amount of budget and schedule and allocation of tasks with respect to whichever of these architectures is actually being implemented. So there's no consistent preference. It's just that each has its benefits and its issues. What about flat versus steep hierarchy, which is better as measured by the count of logical and physical interfaces and elements? Well, we know from architectural heuristics that coupling is an important issue. If we have a flatter hierarchy architecture, then we have the same number of requirements at the very top and the very bottom. Um, 
and a flatter architecture may be more appropriate if we don't need the intermediate specifications. For example, if we're doing internal development, there's no supplier involved. We have off the shelf configuration items, which means some of these CIs actually don't need specifications. Or if it's highly federated and that we have very few interfaces causing these things to interact. On the other hand, it may be more appropriate to have a steeper architecture with this intermediate level, especially when we have outside organizations to which a particular subsystem is wholly allocated, in which case we will, would typically want to write a specification at the subsystem level, even if the supplier were eventually going to show up with additional configuration items, the next lower levels, or if we have phase development where not everything is on the same schedule. You may want to be able to break the system up into these subordinate elements, or if we have subordinate subsystems with high com internal complexity, where we want to um, isolate that complexity among the interacting elements. So we have high coupling among the lowest level CIs, but relatively loose coupling among subsystems. So if we're organized like this, then we probably would want this intermediate level as being easier to manage than a flat hierarchy with high external complexity uh, among many different configuration items. So dealing with complexity and high degree of interaction can influence our choices for how we decide to architect and organize the system. Completeness measures can be addressed. So one of the proposed measures was a number of requirements addressed. And a discriminator should be, of course, that all architectures being considered should address all the top level requirements. One would think that that is a given, but when architectures are proposed, it may be that some of them actually don't address all the requirements or they don't address them adequately. The artifacts that might be produced with respect to uh, various architectures like viewpoints and views are probably not so dependent on the specific architecture, rather they would be more dependent on the architectural processes of the organization. Quality measures um, with respect to the system uh, can be key discriminators. The degree of requirement satisfaction, which would be very related to the requirements addressed. And again, all architectures being considered should satisfy all top level requirements. So the measure would be, is that true? Or what is the count of requirements actually being satisfied or the degree of risk in satisfying them? And I discuss this in the presentation from 2008 on performance based earned value and system engineering effectiveness. The suitability measure, which is about things other than requirements, ends up probably being a key discriminator uh, given that the solutions comply with requirements. And my inference is this was really what our sponsors were interested in is the non-requirement discriminators. So we'll talk about a little bit more on that on the next slide. These last two again deal with standards and representations and the these are probably not so dependent on the particular architecture but rather on the implementation of architecture architecting processes in the organization and are not likely to be discriminators. So the suitability criterion may address such things, attributes like flexibility and adaptability and modularity and simplicity and usability. Um, performance may be the only one of these that's directly related to specific requirements but we constructed a combinational measure of suitability as a weighted utility function of these various attributes. In other words, some of these may have threshold values, some of them may not have threshold values, and we just make some assessment 
of uh, at uh, the degree to which some objective value is being accomplished. And as in any trade-off study or multi-criteria decision analysis, we give some weight to different attributes based on uh, stakeholder preferences. And once we do that, we do a weighted average, and then we can sum all that up and figure out for a given architecture solution, which is the preferred alternative. So threshold implies there's some compliance. Uh, the other suitability portion is the degree of exceeding the requirement. And if there's no requirement, then it's then the threshold is zero for that attribute. And you can plot this on a radar plot to give some visual indication, or you can use a tabular form to come up with a number that's suitable for comparison. Um, if the only way to meet the threshold performance, for example, is some degree is less modularity, then of course the better architecture is the less modular one because it's the only one that's satisfactory with respect to the requirements. So these are uh, perhaps tradable attributes, but we have to ensure that whatever solution we recommend, it satisfies all the requirements. An example in architecting is federated or modular versus highly integrated architecture. So classically, when we organized and architected systems, we used what were called federated systems, where a single function was allocated to a single system. And so in automobiles, we had um, propulsion delivered by a drivetrain, an engine and transmission to the wheels. And we had steering similarly allocated to a steering system and so forth. But in, uh, so this had little cross-functional integration. So function A was wholly allocated to system one and system one was primarily about function A. In modern systems where we're trying to achieve better overall performance, we may end up with situation over here on like integrated distributed system where function A is actually distributed across multiple systems. And one project I worked on, how many computers does it take to turn on a light bulb? The answer ended up being about seven, just because the functionality was distributed through many computers. This makes a more complicated system um, much more difficult to debug failure but it had performance and other advantages that made it the preferred alternative for that project. So architecture is always gonna be a choice that depends on the selection criteria. Modularity simplifies integration, but cross-functional cross cross integration may have better uh, characteristics, but it's also going to require uh, improvement or a, a different program to ensure that when we go and perform integration, we actually have for function A, these three systems available. Whereas in the federated system, function A only requires one system to be able to perform the integration. So this is what I mean by the program impact. If system one were allocated to a single supplier, then you could prove out function A at the supplier. But if function A is distributed across multiple suppliers, then perhaps only the acquirer, the OEM, uh, is able to prove out function A and similarly for function B and other distributed functions. So if we take our suitability criterion and do a simple example of when might you prefer one architecture versus another. Let us say that performance has an attribute weighting of 75% and modularity has an attribute weighting of 25%. So modularity is desirable, for example, for uh, life cycle considerations, not just for fault isolation, but for upgrades and being able to compete subsystems. So it is certainly not without value. Uh, let us say our performance has a 550 nautical mile range threshold, 
with a 600 nautical mile objective. And for modularity, federated is preferred versus fully integrated. And we just, it's a binary decision. And we measure using this expression for suitability, the weight times the ratio of the value minus the threshold to the objective minus the threshold. So using these numbers in examining performance and modularity, and then overall suitability um, for the for system A, if its performance is 550 nautical miles and it's federated, then its calculation would be it gets no performance credit because there's no value above threshold, but it gets full modularity credit. Whereas system B, if it achieves an objective of 600 nautical miles at the trade-off of an integrated architecture, then using the weighted sum, we would come up with a preference for system B because it, it, it satisfies the performance objective at the expense of the modularity objective, but we give more weight to performance and so system B wins. On the, in this case, alternative B is preferred because performance above threshold is deemed to be more valuable than modularity. On the other hand, if we exchange the weights, then alternative A is preferred because modularity becomes more important than range. And I saw in some procurement specifications a strong preference for modularity on the part of our acquirers because of the life cycle impacts. What about complexity? So we were measuring transaction types or messages and frequency per element. There are several different kinds of complexity. There's physical complexity represented here by wire bundles. So one signal per wire and a thousand wires. And these are older uh, platforms uh, that you may be familiar with. More modern platforms trade off physical complexity for functional complexity. I don't have as many wires, but I have a very complicated data bus to be able to um, exchange messages between different configuration items. So I may have only one wire pair, but I have a thousand signals that I have to integrate. So how would I compare those two? Well, I can use some of the measures mentioned. So the count of logical and physical interfaces. I have a thousand discrete wires, but I have one data bus, twisted one twisted shielded pair. Um, the transaction types or messages per element. Well, I have one message per element because every wire is a dedicated signal. So that's much to be preferred. The data bus, I have a thousand. But if I add those up, which is a very simple and maybe silly way to do it, but if I add those up, they look equal. So which is actually more complex? Well, it turns out complexity is determined by your role. If you're the um, configuration manager, you are the physical wire designer, you have to worry about payload and range. Um, you may think that the thousand discrete wires is not such a good solution. In particular, if you have to stuff all those wires into the platform, that's a much bigger task. And so from your perspective, a thousand wires is more complex. On the other hand, if you're the software engineer or the bus integrator, you may think that putting a thousand messages on a, on a twisted shielded pair is a much more complex job. So it looks to you like the data bus is a more complex solution. So it depends on the role as to which one of these solutions might be considered more complex. If we look at performance attributes, well, clearly from a weight perspective, the data bus is going to be preferred. And that's why most platforms have gone to digital interfaces and data buses because overall it's lighter. And, but, and if from a reliability standpoint, it's also going to be 
more robust because I don't have all these wires that can fa fail. I only have one twisted shielded pair and the related drivers in the in the configuration items. On the other hand, the consequences of failure are more difficult to handle for the integrated data bus. If I have a discrete wires and I have a functional failure, I know which wire is carrying that function. So it's easier to isolate and more predictable to know what the failure effects are going to be. In the case of the data bus, I have more common mode failures and the effect of failure somewhere is going to cause more functional impact. Lifecycle management uh, is also a, a discriminator. Um, we have aging wiring worries and there may be more difficulties in physically repairing wires if I have to remove them and replace them. Or if I want to add functionality, I have to add more wires and that may more, be more difficult in integration if I'm space constrained or weight constrained. On the other hand, if I have a data bus and I want to uh, make changes, then I, because of the higher integration, I may require more regression testing to ensure that the additions don't cause problems among the other messages and other functions that are being characterized and transported on the, on the data bus. So again, there's not a clear winner, it depends on what are our overall um, criteria for making a decision and whether we're satisfying the specific performance requirements and not sacrificing some of these other things like reliability and fault isolation and maintainability and life cycle technology insertion. So complexity depends on the role and the best selection is going to depend on the decision criteria. So ultimately, when is one architecture better than another? And of course, the system engineer would say, well, it depends. Uh, clearly, an architecture, one architecture is better when it meets all the requirements and another may not. I mean, that's what we mean by requirement. If you've got to satisfy it, it's a mandatory criterion. So any architecture that doesn't satisfy all the requirements would not be acceptable. If all proposed architectures satisfy all the requirements, then we would select an architecture as being better than another when one satisfies the architecture selection criteria better than another, using, for example, some of the things proposed. And it has lower life cycle costs, which may be built into the suitability selection. For example, there are lower non-recurring costs for development and upgrades and diminished manufacturing sources, or there are lower recurring costs for production and maintenance and spares. And these are difficult to predict ahead of time, of course, but these would be some of the criteria that would go into the suitability uh, measures, which as I said before, I think are going to be the primary discriminators among different architectures for any architectures that satisfy all the requirements. So really the only absolutes are going to be the requirements and the selection of architecture is then going to depend on what are the suitability criteria, how are we going to measure them specifically and perform those uh, analyses as part of system trade-off studies that we should develop during concept development and analysis of alternatives and element selection and trade-offs, trade-off studies uh, and so forth. So there's no absolute answer to this. Um, it, as usual, all depends on, well, what are the decision criteria? So that is what we came to in attempting to apply the architecture measures um, we worked on this actually for a number of years. Um, glad to be able to present this. Again, this is the fourth of my, what I think are my four um, presentations on 
system engineering measurement, although I have discussed measurement in some of the other presentations. I mentioned the 2008 um, presentation, performance-based earn value, which was the first of the series, and then some of the other presentations on requirements, especially the 2015 paper where I talked about uh, requirements quality and the 2018 paper on formalizing requirements verification and validation. So system engineering measurement is an important part of systems engineering and system development that impacts systems over the life cycle. So I urge you to uh, take that seriously and hopefully this presentation on architecture measurement was of some use to you and I look forward to uh, your comments if you have any um, and I wish you well in performing your systems engineering in the future. So have a great day and a great week and a great career.